I've got something to share with you tonight. He's given me a word for you. And uh, I want you to go to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, uh, verse number 39. And we're going to go at it from there, verse number 39 to verse 42. An often overlooked passage of Scripture, not always talked about, not always uh, discussed, not always given the full credit that it should be given. And I think it is in part because the characters in the text have such a dynamic story. Mary, Martha, and, and their brother Lazarus have such an important, powerful story regarding his sickness, his death, and his resurrection that preachers tend to deviate over to the more dynamic and they, they bypass this because it seems simplistic. But this is very, very important. Uh, when you have it, uh, give me some sort of sign. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. Talking about Martha. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, listen to this, Martha, Martha, girl, girl, thou art careful and troubled about many things. You're worried about stuff that doesn't even matter. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. Mary hath chosen that good part. Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Wow. That's where we are tonight. That's where we're going to start. We're going to work our way out from there and see what the Lord says. And tonight we're going to be talking about values. Values. Just, that's all. Just values. Just values. What's, what's, what's it worth? What are you worth? What is this opportunity worth? What is this moment worth? And perceiving the value of a moment is most significant. It is very significant. And Martha and Mary perceived this moment totally different. Isn't it amazing how two people can have the same experience at the same time in the same place and have a completely different reaction to it? Why is it? Why is it that we can go to the same service and hear the same message and walk away with two different reactions to it? Even though we were in the same church, we were exposed to the same music, heard the same message, and we walk away with two different ideas. Why, why is it that uh, you can post something about preaching and somebody is more focused on, on something that doesn't even matter? You know, uh, they, 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 get, they get caught up in the simplicity. It's because of what they value. It's because of what they value. What you receive is a direct reflection of what you value. The anointing that you value is the anointing that you receive. And there they are with Jesus. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, it had been great to be Paul or Peter or something. They have Jesus in the house. Jesus in the house. Jesus in the house. Let's start with that. Jesus, let that sink in for a minute. Jesus is at your house. Okay. He's physically manifested in your house. And you worried about doing the dishes and, 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 and who serves the tea and, and who brings the hot bread out of the oven. And, and Jesus is in the house. And that's what Martha is concerned about. She's concerned the, about the work of the Lord. Okay. Not the Lord of the work. She's concerned about the work of the Lord. Not the Lord of the work. Because she thinks it is important, and it is, the work of the Lord. But she doesn't see that more important than the work of the Lord is the Lord of the work. And let me tell you something. There are a whole lot of Marthas in this world, not just people named Martha. There are a lot of people named Martha. There are a lot of women in the world, but there are a lot of Marthas in the world whose name is Jim and Fred and, and Apostle so-and-so and Bishop so-and-so who, who are more focused on the work of the Lord than the Lord of the work. They got great programs. They got great things in place. They're doing great things in the community. They're activists. They're socially involved. But they have lost sight of the Lord of the work. 
So they're doing Jesus things, but they but they don't really value Jesus. She's doing really good things. She's feeding people. She's serving. She's taking care of needs. She's making sure everything is neat and tidy and clean. That's nice. But it's not nicer than an opportunity. Hey, Jesus is over. And he's talking. And they're both exposed to the same thing, but they have a completely different reaction. This is true about children. You can raise up your kids, uh, two kids in the same house, ate the same food, had the same parents, and go two completely different directions. You think, what in the world did I do wrong? It's not always about what you did wrong or right. It's about what they value, what they appreciate. And tonight we're talking about values because values are important. They're important about everything. When you go in the store, you get ready to buy something, and most of us don't just buy it and go to the counter. We look at the price. We want to know what the valuation is. What's it going to cost? What's it going to cost? We get ready to build a house. You don't want to tell a builder, just build me the house and send me the bill. No, no, no. I want to know what it's going to cost. What is the value of it? I want to, I want to, if I, if it's already built, I want an appraisal. I want to know what it is valued at. Before I make an offer, I want to know what the valuation is because the valuation determines how much I have to give. And in every time when it comes to value, it's about an exchange. I give this that I might get that. Now, it doesn't look like Mary is giving anything. Martha's giving everything. She's running around, sweeping and cleaning up and getting everything tidy and serving. And she's giving obvious things. Mary, on the other hand, is giving something to you. You don't see it because she's just sitting there. It doesn't look like she's giving anything, but she is giving something that is very important. She's giving her attention. <clears throat> yeah. And whatever you give your attention to, that's what you value. There should be many more people uh, in the Bible class tonight than what he is. I thank God for the thousands of people that are. But there are thousands and thousands of people right now who are about to jump off the bridge for the lack of teaching that they should be getting right now. But they don't value it. They don't connect Jesus and the word as an answer to the issues they have in their life. So your choices, your decisions, what you give your attention to isn't a reflection of what you value. If I had some money in my hand, I, I could hold it up and, and I would tell you that this money is good in exchange for goods and services. That's what it's for. Other than that, you give me a hundred dollar bill. I can't sleep in it. I, I can't eat it. I can't wear it. It's, it's exchange though. I can through it. I can get to what I can eat or what I can wear or, or what I can see. And so there's always an exchange based on value. People who want something for nothing always fail. <clears throat> they they fail. They get by for a while. They they con everybody for a while, but ultimately they fail because there's a system in the earth of sowing and reaping and seed time and harvest, and you can't harvest where there are no seeds, and you cannot reap what you have not sown, and there is an involvement of exchange, a medium of exchange that determines what you value. Okay? And so you, you can only go so long uh, freeloading, and eventually it explodes on you. It, it, it is not going to be successful. You're going to end up depressed. You're going to end up defeated, and you're going to feel sorry for yourself, and you're going to blame everybody. But the truth of the matter is you weren't willing to give attention or time or effort or work to what, what was in front of you. Now, both women are giving something. I'm not belittling Martha. Martha is giving something. But she has not chosen the best thing to give for the moment that she has. She has a moment with Jesus. And she's worried about dishes. And she's worried about tablecloths. She has a moment with Jesus. Her values are not in the right place. And it will always come back to haunt you when your values are not in the right place. It will always come back to haunt you when your values are not in the right place. So tonight... We're talking about values. And we're also talking about what you value. And we're going to also digress to who values you. Because those are the people you need to spend time with and invest your attention and energy and emotions and even your dollars uh, into people that value 
who you are, what you are, and what you have to give. <clears throat> who you are, what you are, and what you have to give. People who value that, you can tell. They dignify it with their attention. They dignify it with their resources. They, they dignify it through their response. Do you value the moment? This is a moment. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like a big moment, but it's got everything to do with every other moment that's going to happen in their life. They're building relationship with Jesus, and that's an important thing to do. You can't wait till you're in a crisis and send for Jesus you never fed, you never met, you never entertained, you never interacted with him. And now when your brother gets sick, you're sending for a stranger. Relationship is everything. And I hope you get this. I can't say anything more important. This relationship is everything. Religion is wonderful. Relationship is everything. I know a lot of people who have great religion, but they don't have great relationship. They don't have relationship with the God that they have, that they say that they serve through their religion. They're doing the dishes, but they're not sitting at the feet of Jesus. Religion does the dishes, relationship sits at his feet. Religion does the dishes, relationship sits at his feet. If you can learn that about Jesus, you can learn that about your children, your spouse, your life, everything is connected to relationship. And that's important. It's important to understand. It's, it's part of why I work, don't drop the mic. Because you can't have a relationship with somebody you're not talking to or somebody you're not listening to or somebody you're not paying attention to. You can't just get up on the stage and perform. Relationship is everything. It's everything. And here it is clear that Jesus values Mary's attention more than he does Martha's serving. Well, what can we learn about that? Then God is saying, when my glory, when my presence comes in the room, pay attention. Don't be distracted. There's nothing worse. You know, it, even down to something as simple as watching a movie. I hate to watch movies with people who want to talk to you while you're watching the movie, especially the kind of movies I like to watch. They're intense and they have a lot of drama. And, and, and I'm trying to follow the drama and see where the movie's going. And it's impactful. And, and if you miss any little thing, any little thing, you miss everything. This is a little thing. This story is a little thing. It doesn't look like a big thing. It's not Jesus at the tomb raising Lazarus from the dead. It's nothing dramatic like and roll the stone away, come forth, like, nothing big like that. But if you don't have this, you don't have that. So you've got to understand that values and valuation and how you value your faith and how you value people must start before the crisis. You can't get in the crisis and then build a relationship. You can't just send somebody something on Instagram and expect them to invest in your corporation. You don't have a relationship with them. You don't have a relationship. You might have a great deal, but if you don't build a relationship with them, people very seldom do business with people they don't have a relationship with. Relationship is important. Charisma is important. Paying attention is important. Letting people feel heard is important. Martha missed it. Poor thing. She missed it. Busy as she was, good as she was, great woman of God, but she missed it because she wasn't paying attention. You'd be surprised at the people, even out of the people that log on, who log on, but are having a separate conversation, completely different conversation, while the Bible class is going on. They're talking about something else, some way over in, in, in Palestine or some way over in politics or somewhere. Their, their mind is somewhere else. They don't know how to focus. They don't know how to focus. They have an attention deficit disorder. They, they medicate that because focus is important. And if you have a, a, an attention deficit disorder, get some medication because focus is important. Focus is important. And when you focus on something, you value it. And valuation is everything. And tonight we're talking about values. So, okay, enough about that. I'm going to share a story. Here's one of my stories. So... A father had a daughter who had graduated from high school and he decided to give her a car. He had this old car he'd had in the garage for a long, long time and he decided to give, her, give it to her as a gift. It was an old car, old car, very old car. 
and he gave her the car as gift. And he said, take the car down to the dealer and see what he will give you for. Determine this value. And the, the man looked at the car at the dealership. He walked all around it. He said, this car is old. It's, you know, the, the parts are hard to find. Uh, this car was out 20 some years ago or longer. And uh, uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a thousand dollars for it. So she took the car back home. She said, Daddy, he said that the car was old, been around a long time, hard to find parts for it. He gave me a thousand dollars for it. He said, okay, okay, okay. Take it to the pawn shop. Go to the pawn shop and ask him what they'll give you for it. She drove the car over to the pawn shop. Pawn dealer said, we don't normally even take cars, ma'am. We don't take cars. That's not what we do. Ah, but she kept going on and on and on. He said, okay, I'll go out there and take a look at it. He went out there. He walked around the car and came back in and shook his hand and said, I give you $100 for it. She drove the car back home. She said, Daddy, he said he'd give me $100 for it. Big difference between the two. He said, one more place I want you to take it. I want you to take it down to somebody who is a collector. So she took the car down to a collector who specialized in old cars. And he said, oh, my God, do you know what you have here? He looked at it, he looked up, he said, oh, it's, it's got its original seats in it. The original engine is still there. It's, it has no real damage to it. Oh, he said, this is so powerful. I'll give you $100,000 for it. She said, you will? Oh, my God. She came back. She said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. She said, he said he would give me $100,000 for it. Dad said, good. He said, this is why I gave you the car. I wanted you to teach, I wanted to teach you a simple, simple lesson. That how people value you depends on who they are. And never go to anybody who doesn't appreciate you on the level that you're worth. So if you find somebody who's just going to give you $100 or somebody who going to give you $1,000, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that you haven't found the right place. When you find the right place, you'll know because they will value you. Cool lesson? Absolutely. I think that some of you are a $100,000 car being sold for $100. A hundred thousand dollar car giving yourself away to thousand dollar people. Nothing wrong with the person. They just don't have the appreciation for who you are. Find people who appreciate you at the level that you are worth. What I also want you to see about here is what is valuable to one person is junk to somebody else. Somebody's trash is somebody else's treasure. And don't allow somebody who sees you as, as, as trash to make you see yourself as trash when you know your treasure. Your treasure when you find somebody who can see it. Now, can you see it in yourself? Martha could not see that the real treasure of the moment wasn't mopping it wasn't cleaning up. It wasn't making sure all the dishes were washed. The real treasure of the moment was to get to sit at the feet of a Jesus who wasn't going to be there very long. Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about with so much care, needless things that are on your mind. The things you're worried about are not important. You want me to make Mary get up from being at my feet while I'm talking to her? To enter into your lower valuation of me? And you want me to make her do it? She has chosen the good part. Wow. She has chosen the good part. It is interesting to understand that Jesus is a frequent visitor at their house. And over the course of time, they build up a relationship with him that ultimately saved their brother's life and got him raised from the dead. But the resurrection of Lazarus started 
with Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. That's important for you to understand, that there is a correlation between valuation and the miraculous power of God being exemplified in your life. So nothing that you do, giving him attention is wasted time. Every praise, every worship, every moment of meditation, devotion, consecration, talking to him while you're driving to work, building relationship with him, all comes back to bless you in the time of need or grief or sickness or sorrow to strengthen you in a way that you would not be strengthened had you not had a relationship with him. Countless people come to you with no relationship asking you to do stuff for them. They don't understand that nobody wants to open up the door to a request. You want to open up the door to a friend. And then after the friendship is established, then you can listen at the request and you hear it different. You hear it different when you know that, the, that they knocked on the door for you and not for it. Who's knocking at your door right now? And what do they want? Who sees you for $100 or $1,000 and doesn't see your real value. Or maybe you're the one who's giving $100 to a $100,000 opportunity. Maybe you're the one that's not giving full attention to the opportunity that's right in front of you because you don't value it. You don't value it. Much of our lives, some of the greatest things that happened to us, we didn't fully value it at the time. I didn't value how I was raised while I was being raised. I thought my father was mean, you know. I thought he fussed too much. I thought my mother would talk too much. I, I didn't think they were hip. I didn't think they were cool. I didn't think that later on I came to appreciate, 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 appreciation who they were. Now they're both gone. Oh, what I wouldn't give to hear their voice again. Oh, what I wouldn't give to be in the kitchen and, 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 and watch my mother cook again. Oh, what I wouldn't give uh, to go with her to a business meeting or one of her conventions she drug me to. Oh, what I wouldn't give to be with my father in one of those overnight working jobs where we had to work all night just to be around him. I would do it in a heartbeat. Make sure that the moments that you have and the people that you have, you value them while you have them because you may not ever have that opportunity again. All of that is being taught here. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about it because they leap over this and go to the Lazarus is sick, let's go get Jesus. They forget that you had to have a relationship with Jesus to be able to go send for him, break up his schedule, get his attention, and get him to come back. That's only on the strength of the relationship. Mary clearly has chosen the good part. She's chosen the best part. She's given attention to what matters the most. And he says to Martha, I want to read again, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Are you careful and troubled about many things that in the scheme of what is in front of you don't matter? I went one time to see my grandmother. Uh, I went every year to see my grandmother. When I was a kid, my grandmother had several rules. Shut that screen door or you're going to die. Please do not sit on my bed. When my grandmother got through making up a bed, her bed was so tight you could bounce a quarter off it. You sit on that bed, it might cost you your life. I came back as an adult, and, and all these kids were all over my grandmother's bed, and she wasn't saying nothing. They were running in and out the door and leaving the door open, and she didn't say nothing. I said, Granny, are you okay? She said, what's the matter, Tommy? I said, Granny, they left the door open, they're all over the bed. They wrinkled up the bed. She said, she said, I learned that wasn't as important as I thought it was. Some of the things that you are worried about right now are not nearly as important as you think they are. You are like Martha. You are troubled about many things. 
you are careful about many things, but one thing is needful. Find your one thing. Out of all the things that's on your list of things that need to be done and got to be done, what is the one thing that boils down to this is my priority because this is what I value the most? In order to find out your priority, you have to know your core values. What are your core values? Now, it's hard to ask church people about core values because they go deep and they get scripture and they say, you know, my core value is to praise the Lord. My core value. No, let me ask it another way. What do I get when I get you? Is it, is it loyalty? Is it trust? Is it integrity? Is it uh companionship what are your core values what makes you tick what would you leave dirty dishes to have <laughs> some of y'all say anything <laughs> what what would you leave other things that are important behind in order to focus on find your one thing this is so good so that at least you know, I'm not saying you won't have to do dishes sometimes, but I'm saying that faced with an, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to, to hear Jesus teach, don't be up making beds. Don't be focused on other things. Don't be on your knees praying about things that are of little consequence compared to what is being offered to you. Martha didn't get the value of what was being offered to her. He was offering her a chance to build a relationship that ultimately would save her brother's life. Jesus didn't turn around and come back to their house because she washed dishes. He came back because Mary had chosen the best part. She valued his presence before she got in trouble. Now, when you get in trouble, everybody values your attention. But what you did before determines how things happen in the end. It, what you did pre determines what's destined. What you did pre, which means before, determines your destiny. Whatever you value before you need it, is what comes back to bless you when you need it. You can't wait till you need it and then reach out there and get it and claim a right to it and be mad because I didn't do it when you didn't build the relationship that was necessary before. Let's go deep. This is good. This is good. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. I'm, I'm jumping right into the middle of it. If you're just coming on right now, you missed a whole lot. I, 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 don't, I don't even know where to, where to start uh, to really get you caught up, but, but you missed a whole lot. I wrote down, let me see how many of them. I wrote down six things uh, that I want you to think about. Number one, the danger of inflation. The danger of inflation, what I mean by that is the Bible says you ought not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. Okay? Some people are inflated. They have inflated egos. They have infl they only cater to people who have an inflated image of them. They, they think that they're better than they are at what they do. Uh, I, I've seen people who thought, you know, I need that opportunity. They need to give that opportunity to me. The truth of the matter is they weren't ready for it. Inflation, inflation, uh, you're a king in your own eyes. You're great in your own eyes. You, you, you think that you're better at it than you are. And that's a dangerous thing. The Bible said you ought not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. It's a very, very dangerous thing to have an overinflated self-image. You don't want to have low self-esteem, but you don't want to have an overinflated self-image. I'm too good to do that. I'm too good to do this. I'm too good to do the other. I'm too good to do no, 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 no. Calm down overinflated. When I first became a pastor, I went to a convention and I went to the convention and the late Dr. Quandra Wilson was there and they were getting ready to start service and they wanted somebody to play the piano. And he asked me, would I go play the piano for the service to start? And I looked at him and I said, uh, I'm a pastor now. 
He said, and he looked at me and said, who plays at your church? And I dropped my head and I said, I do. He said, then you can play here. And I went to the piano and I started playing. I thought my title made me more important than I was. He brought me back down to earth because I was overly inflated. So I ended up playing the piano. Do you have, uh, are you wrestling with the danger of inflation where you think you're ready for things you're not ready for and you're angry with God because they're not coming together? And the truth of the matter, you're not ready for it. You don't take care of the goldfish, but you want to get married. You don't want to walk the dog, but you want a wife. You don't take care of the child you have, but you're talking about having another child. Inflation, where you have an overinflated ego. You can't run the barbershop, but you're talking about running the church. The danger of inflation. I want you to get that. Number two. Don't settle for deflation. Somebody who has uh, a low value of you, don't let that become your value of yourself. Just because the, the broker only wanted to give you $100 doesn't mean that that's all you're worth. Know when to walk away. And there are some people who can never see the treasure in you. And you keep laboring and laboring and trying to talk them into how important it is. You don't have enough life left to convince somebody that you're valuable. You have to go on. You cannot allow people to put you on sale and put you in the bargain basement and leave you there. Overinflation is just as bad as deflation, where you have no self-esteem, no confidence, no worth, no value. You do things you don't even want to do. You say things you don't even want to say. You let people behave in ways that you normally wouldn't tolerate, but you're so desperate for their attention that you'll do anything to get it. That's the second problem with values. When you have low self-esteem and low value and you don't think highly enough of yourself, people can do anything before you. When it comes to God, all bets are off. Prostrate yourself. That's why they laid prostrate on the floor. I am nothing. Samuel said, we are poured out like water. What does water do? It abases itself. When it comes to God, whatever I got is nothing. Whatever I own is nothing. Whatever talent I got is nothing. Whatever I learned is nothing. Nobody's going to be teaching classes in heaven. None of the professors, none of the theologians, none of the scholars, uh, none of them are going to be teaching in heaven. None of them. None of them, none of them, none of them. This, this book, you're going to get this book, get it now. It will not be on sale in heaven. Nobody's wisdom will be valuable in heaven because when we come before him, we will be poured out like water. <laughs> That's how amazing your God is. Your God is so amazing that everything that looks amazing now falls on the floor like water compared to him. So when it comes to God, you always want to be deflated. You always want to let all the air out the tire. You want to humble yourself before him. But you don't want nobody stabbing your tires, raining on your parade, belittling you. It's one thing for me to prostrate myself. It's another thing for you to prostrate me and make me feel like nothing and belittle me and bring me down to nothing. And there are people who live off of the energy of making you feel bad about you. Don't let them do that. I'm talking about values tonight. If you just joined in, we're talking about values. And we're really sharing some things that I think are important, that are necessary, that will help you to grow into the things of God, that will help you to develop as a believer, that will cause you to have a, a correct analysis of what you bring to the table, who you are, what you're worth, what you do, what you have to offer, and what you don't have to offer, a realistic expectation. Now, we teach faith. You can believe God for this, that, and that. I can believe God for a carpet. That doesn't mean I can drive. I can believe God for a wife, but am I a husband? I'm amazed at the people that are believing God for a spiritual father, but they don't know how to be a spiritual daughter or a spiritual son. And they'll jump up real quick. That's my spiritual father. And then when the relationship ensues, they don't have a clue how to be a son. They don't have a clue how to be a daughter. They just don't know how. They're not bad people. They just don't have a clue how to value having that 
thing that they prayed for. You might be praying for something that you don't really appreciate the value of it. And maybe God isn't giving it to you because you're not ready to fully appreciate and give it the attention that it needs in order to maintain it. You don't need a garage if you don't have a car. You don't need gas if you don't have a car. You don't need an oil change if you don't have a car. You don't need a filter change if you don't have a car. To him whom much is given, much is required. Before you start praying for much, be sure that you can pay the requirement that's necessary to function on that level. We're talking about values tonight. We're talking about the difference between Mary and Martha. We're talking about Mary who is mesmerized to Jesus. She's mesmerizing Jesus. She's just looking at Jesus in the face. Oh, wow. Oh, she's hanging on his every word. And Martha running around, picking up plates and moving dishes. And Martha stops and talks to Jesus. And this is her prayer. Make her get up and do some work. She's in the presence of somebody who will later raise her brother from the dead who will raise himself from the dead, who will, who will raise himself up from the dead with such pageantry that when he dies, graves open up all over Jerusalem. And her prayer to him is, make my sister wash these dishes. Sometimes we ask God for stuff that really doesn't matter. It's really not that big a deal. It's really not that big a thing. Martha, Martha. Seldom do you hear Jesus call somebody by the name twice. Because normally, when in the Bible, when the name is called twice, it's a sign of covenant. Abraham, Abraham. Whenever you hear God call Moses, Moses, take off your shoes the ground you stand on is holy ground. Joshua, Joshua, whenever you hear God use the name twice, twice, boom, boom. Once has he spoken it, twice have I heard it. Power belongs to God. It's a covenant relationship. Jesus, verily, verily, this day shall thou be with me in paradise. That's, that's, that's covenant talk. Martha, Martha, what's wrong with you? That you are majoring on the minor and minoring on the major. Let me go on, let me go on. If I want to know number three, uh, your credit card reflects your values. If I want to know what you value, let me see your credit card statement. Let me see your phone. I, I can find out real quick what you value because what you value, you give money to and you give attention to. So if I'm going to do an investigation on you, those are two things I need to know to find out who you are. I can quickly find out without sitting down talking to you who you are by what you give your time to and what you give your money to. What you give your time to and what you give your money to tells me what you value. Are you asking God to value you with what he has to give you while you don't value him with what you have to give him? I want, that's a C-Law moment. I paused on purpose. I'm not thinking of something to say. We want God to give us what he's got in his hand while we hold back what we have in ours. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about talent. I'm talking about ability. I'm talking about singing. I'm talking about doing whatever we can, whatever gifts we have been given. We want him to give us his gifts while we refuse him our own. And Mary's just looking at him like this. She's giving him her full attention. Her everything is focused on that. I'll do the dishes later. This is a God moment, and I value this moment with God. I value this moment with God. I value this moment with God. I cannot stay in a place where my anointing is not valued. You don't have to like me. That's okay. You don't even have to know me. That's okay. But for me to do what I do, you have to value what God has given me. I cannot continue to minister in a place where I am not appreciated for what God gave me. You don't have to worship me. You don't have to bow when I come in the door and all that kind of stuff. No, 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 no. No, I'm talking about what God gave me is important and it's valuable and it deserves some of this. 
not somebody who's moving all around. And you can feel it when you're up ministry. You can feel it when somebody values what you have and what you don't have. And, and so the third point, I want to go back to that. I got off track. Your credit card reflects your values. If, if Between your credit card and your telephone, I can tell what you value. If I open up your credit card and your phone, what would it teach me about you? If I open up your credit card and your phone, what would it teach me about what you value? And I don't say this to condemn you or to make you feel bad. I want to make you think. What changes do you need to make in what you give to and what you pay attention to in order to change the outcome of your life? So that when you have a crisis and you need God's attention, you can get his attention. Mm. <laughs> Number four, valuation is more than dollars. Valuation is more than dollars. I touched on that a little bit, but I'm going to go deeper than that. Valuation is time. Valuation is attention. I learned that as a father. I didn't f I know that at first, that, that when you value your family, you have to spend time with them. I'll come home. I came home every night. I worked hard, came home every night. I check with the kids. How y'all doing? Everybody good? Everybody say, yeah. I went on, got undressed, did my thing, whatever I had to do next, so forth. So I didn't understand that them saying, yeah, didn't mean they were okay. The valuation is more than dollars. So you send the kid a check every month. That doesn't make him have a father. Valuation is more, when you value something, you spend some time with it. Valuation is more than dollars. Away from me, all you people who only call when you want something. Valuation is more than dollars. You always want me to pray. You're not praying for me. You want me to give you what I got, but you don't give what you have. Valuation is more than dollars. Number five, appraisals start with childhood experiences. Now, what I mean by that is this. If, if I were going to sell this house, I'd get an appraisal on it. If I were going to buy this house, I'd get an appraisal on it. An appraisal tells me at this particular time, what is this worth? Okay. Appraisals start with childhood experiences. How we value ourselves has a lot to do with things that happened to us when we were children or didn't happen when we were children. What we think of ourselves has a lot to do with childhood experiences. I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a therapist and I'm not going to try to, 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 to treat childhood scars and issues. But if you're wondering why you have such a low valuation of yourself, it's not that you're not valuable. You just don't see yourself correctly because of things that happen early in your life. Value appraisals start with childhood experiences. The feeling of self-worth starts with children. And yet it, the hardest thing to get people to do is work in children's ministry. You get all kinds of people to sing in the choir. It's difficult to get people to work in children's ministry, but appraisals start with childhood experiences. I still remember the names. Now, I'm 60 plus years old. I still remember the names of the people who spent time with me when I was five and when I was eight. My Sunday school teachers, I could name them right now. Vacation Bible School, I could name them right now. The Sunbeam Choir Director, I could name it right now. My first solo, I could name it right now. Appraisals start with childhood experiences. And the problems we're having right now in our communities, in our families, is because we don't, we don't train up the child in the way he should go. No, because it's too much trouble getting them up, getting them ready, getting them out for church. We don't want to be bothered. We leave them at home. And then when they get in trouble, we want to bring them to church. The Bible says start, you, you train up the child in the way that he should go. Appraisals start with childhood experiences. So training them is more than beating them. I'm not talking about beating them. I'm talking about attention. I'm talking about exposure. I'm talking about having conversations. Appraisals start with childhood experiences. I got better as a father with every child. <laughs> Sorry to those ones. Uh, you, you get better because you begin to learn 
where to put your energy and your effort. I can't tell you how many people are so busy making a living that they don't have a life. And, and, and I began to learn something that I'm trying to help you with to understand that you shape that child when they're five, three, four, six, seven, eight. Those, those, those years, you're shaping how they see themselves, how they see you, how they see the world. I remember everybody, all my aunts and uncles, every last one of them, I could name every one of them, and especially the ones who spent some time with me. I remember every moment they spent time with me, and they all collectively have something to do with how I turned out. What about the person who had a terrible childhood? Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. How can I, Lord, how can I go back into my mother's womb? No, 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 no. To be born of the water, to be born of the spirit, cancels out the childhood and gives you a chance to start with fresh experiences and a fresh identity. And you start making um, affirmations like, I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I can have what God, all of those kinds of things that you repeat to yourself are canceling out all those things that happened in the past. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel like I'm talking to somebody right now who said, well, if appraisals start with childhood experiences, I'm in trouble because my childhood was horrible. No, you're not. No, you're not. You just need to walk into the new birth. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All old things are passed away and all things become new. And you need to let those new things take away those old things out of your life and start right there. In fact, I be that. You can start right now. Right now. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I am an overcomer. I am victorious. I am fearfully and marvelously made. As thick as I am, as thin as I am, as dark as I am, as light as I am, as tall as I am, as shorter, I am marvelously made. Start affirming yourself and building yourself up and you can cancel out that, that bad uh, appraisal that started too early in life, given away, thrown away, beat up, ostracized, mama dropped you in a trash can, somebody found you in a dumpster. There's some horrible stories I've heard uh, throughout my life, been raped and molested and abused and given away from foster home to foster home and all of that. And yet some people who came from that background end up doctors and lawyers and running the world and running the country and others end up strung out on heroin. You have to, you have to come to a point and say, wait a minute, I'm going to start over. I'm going to do this over. I'm going to go back. I'm going to wipe, wipe the slate clean and allow the Holy Spirit to create in me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit. That's the kind of way you talk to God when you need to wipe away, create in me a clean heart. I don't have one. Create in me a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit. I didn't get what I should have got when I should have got it, but I will not spend the rest of my life up under the curse of a bad appraisal. I'm going to get a second opinion. Here comes Jesus. Jesus thought so much of you that when they did evaluation and they asked him how much he would pay for you, he went to the cross and died for you. That's how much God thinks of you. That's how much God thinks of you, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who so ever foster child Nobody's child, biracial, rape victim, whatever, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He has adopted you into the royal family. We were strangers and alien, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel in Ephesians chapter 2. But now, but God, who is rich in mercy, wherein he has loved us, 
He, he commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. These, this is why you need to know your Bible, not just your preacher. You need to know your Bible. We're living in a generation where people know their preacher and they, oh, you're my preacher. I just love you. You're my preacher. I just love to hear the word of God. You need to fall in love with the word. The preacher's going to die. The word will never die. The preacher's going to fail. The word will never fail. All preachers fail. All of them. Some of it goes public. Some of it doesn't. All preachers fail. All preachers fail. You know why? They're made out of the same dirty, filthy clay that you're made out of. You don't build your hope on a man. You build your hope on his word, on the word of God. It is the word that I speak unto you that are spirit and life, not me. I'm just like you, trying to make it through this world best way I can. But the word that I shut out, oh, bless his high name, the word that I speak unto you is spirit, and it is life, and it's solid, and heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or one tittle of his word will fail. His preachers will fail. His prophets will fail. His prophetess will fail. His bishops will fail. All of that, all of that, all of that, all of that will fail. All of that will fail, but the word itself will never fail. Build your hopes on things that are eternal and get this word down in you so that you can make the kind of affirmations that correct the appraisal you should have gotten from your childhood and you can start over from where you are, yes, even at 50, yes, even at 65, you can start over, yes, even at 82, you can start over right now with a much better opinion of yourself as you let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, we're having a great time tonight, aren't we? Are you getting something out of this Bible class? I want you to write something on the line that you're getting out of this Bible class. I want to hear it right now. I want you to hear it. I want to hear it. I want to see you type it. I want to see you declare it. I want to see you confess it. Confession is made unto salvation. Confess it. A new beginning, a fresh start, a new life, a new appraisal. I'm getting an upgrade. I'm getting an upgrade. And that brings me to my sixth one. Reevaluate through upgrades. That's what we're talking about, is reevaluating yourself through an upgrade. You upgrade, you upgrade. Sometimes when you're doing, I do real estate a lot. They, they come in and they say the house is nice, but it needs upgrades. It needs to be upgraded. Uh, the, the faucets are outdated and the fixtures are outdated and the doorknobs are outdated and this and that is outdated. It's got mirrors all over the house like it's 1970. It needs this, it needs that, it needs other. And you do the upgrades and it changes the valuation. Listen, all you need is an upgrade. All you need is an upgrade. Reevaluate through the upgrade. Let's do some upgrades. You can't help what you did. You can't help where you came from. You can't help what you've been through. You can't help what your parents did. But you can get an upgrade. You can get an upgrade. Tonight we're talking about values. And this is really, really good. I got some more for you. Are you ready for this? I want to share some more with you. I want you to go to John 11, 19 and 20, because now we're going uh, to the scene where Lazarus is dead. And, and, and Jesus is coming into the house. And the Bible said that many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. All I want is these last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. But Mary was still in the house. Martha goes running out the door to meet Jesus. But Mary was still in the house. Oh, Lord, teach me to be still in the house. Not frantic, not angry. Not shocked. Give me that stillness, that steadiness. Mary was steady in a way that Martha was all over the place. Running out there hollering, you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Da, 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 da. Shut up. Martha, Martha, you always did talk too much. You always did have your mouth going when you ought to be still. Shut up. Mary is still 
God wants you to have a still, God wants you to have a still spirit, a still spirit. Peace be still, a still spirit, a still and steady spirit. She's still, she's still in the house, steady as she was when Jesus was there. Because Martha thinks Jesus is coming. Mary knows he never left. Mary is still in the house. I pray that God would make you still in your own house. Calm in your own skin. Confident in who you are. Still. Mary was still in the house. And I know it, it means that Mary stayed in the house while Martha went outside. But it also means that Mary was still in the house. A calmness, a peace, a, a, a benefit that comes from what she valued. What are your core values? What do you value? What do you care about? What would you fight for? What would you stare at? That's what you value. Church lasts too long, you don't value it. I don't think all the shouting is necessary, you don't value it. I never let sinners come in and tell me what I'm worth and what I should be getting and what I should be doing. You don't value it. Anytime you think it's all right for the drug dealer to have something but not the preacher, you, that's because that's what you value. Hip-hop artists can have it, but I can't have it. That's what you value. That's your pastor. That's your 50 cents, your pastor. And you're good with it. You, 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 you don't value this. So you don't respect it. You don't see anybody going on a rant about nobody else having anything except the man or woman of God. It's because they don't value it. I'm not talking about slick, sneaky, creeping preachers that's ripping everybody off and the church is raggedy and the building's torn down and he's living in a mansion and the church is meeting in a garage. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. He's got problems that need to be worked out. His values are not in the right place. Not that he can't be used of God, but his values are not in the right place. But I am talking about people who have loved God's people, feared God's people, served God's people. You don't get to stand up at a strip club and tell me what I'm worth. You just don't. I'm sorry, you just don't. The reason you don't think I'm not worth anything is you don't value me. The reason you don't get up out of the bed on Sunday, you don't value it. You gonna get up on Monday. You gonna get up on Monday. And isn't it, isn't it amazing how you find a way to get out the house on Monday but can't on Sunday? I'm talking about your values tonight. What do you value? What is most important to you as a person, do you value the things of God? I got one more scripture. I got one more scripture. I'm going to wrap this up and let you go. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 through 10. Part of it is one of the most quoted scriptures uh, in the Bible. Verse 7 Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Or in King James, be, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Everybody, everybody who knows much about their Bible at all quotes this scripture. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. They don't read what was right before it, but we are. Let's start at verse four. Each one should test their own actions. So you're constantly testing your own actions, doing evaluations and updates and upgrades on who you are. That's what it means to be a Christian. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. You're not running against anybody else. You're running against yourself. I'm never preaching against the other preacher. We're on the same team. I'm preaching against the voice I hear in my own head. And I got a long ways to go to get it out like he puts it in. But that's, that's what I'm working on. I'm testing myself by my own actions. 
then you can take pride in yourself, in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. You don't need to be like nobody else. You need to be a great you. For each one should carry their own load. Each one should carry their own load. My grandmother used to say every tub needs to stand on its own bottom. You need to carry your own load. There's something wrong anytime you are content. Now, any of us can get in a situation where we have to be carried. Physically, financially, emotionally, a, a, a trauma, a death, a crisis, you need to be carried. Anybody, for a little while. There's something wrong with you when you are happy to be carried for long periods of time. You should be able, each one should carry their own load. We don't hear nobody quoting that. Oh, I hope you get this tonight. Woo! My God, are you getting this tonight? That's where self-esteem and self-respect for yourself comes from. When you carry your own load. If four people are carrying a box and you're, you're carrying your own corner, you're, you got your corner down. You don't have to carry somebody else's corner. Carry your corner. Each, your corner. Each one should carry their own load. Never, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Paul says, if you are getting instruction in the word and it's causing you to be blessed, and it's causing you to grow, and it's causing you to get promotions, and it's causing you to have increase, and it's causing you to prosper. Through the word that he is speaking to them, he said, it's only right that you share out of what God has blessed you with since it was inspired or instigated or fertilized by what I preached to you. If I gave you what I had, it's only fair that you that you give back, not all of it, but that you give some, some acknowledgement Back in the way you give, in the way you sow, in the way you serve, or you robbed. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Galatians. I didn't write this. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Who feeds you? Feed what's feeding you. If it's feeding you, if it's helping you to grow, if it's making you a better person, if it's causing you to have increase, feed what's feeding you. He said, you should then share with your instructor. Now, he's talking about first being responsible, carrying your own load, doing your own thing. But then when it comes to ministry, he says, if I'm ministering things to you that cause you to have increase and you don't share with the one who ministered it to you, then that's wrong. Nobody quotes that. Then he said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. See, now we're into the, now he reaps what he sows. But all of this is tied in together about appreciation, valuing. No wonder Mary was staring at Jesus as he was teaching. Because her life was going to be altered by what he was teaching. And she shares, every time he comes into the city, she shares, come and stay with me. She shares what she has because he shares what he has and it's a fair exchange and it's no robbery. Good God of mercy, it's good. The world knows this. The world knows this. They go to their conferences, they go to their conventions at way, 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 way higher prices than you can do in the church. And they go and they receive and they share back. They know that. They know that. They know that. They absolutely know that. They get that. They understand that. Corporations understand that they don't get access to your platform without contributing to your platform. It's only us who want to receive something and then begrudge the person who taught us how to receive it. Paul condemns it here. Then he goes on, whosoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whosoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. He says, what I'm giving you is going to cause you not only on this side, but on that side to reap eternal life. 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 Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap 
a harvest if we do not give up. All of this is built around receiving great teaching and sowing back into great ministry. And then he said, don't be weary in well-doing, for you will reap in due season if you don't give up. If you give up before harvest time, it's not my fault. The seed was good. And when the season is right, the seed is going to harvest. And when it harvests, a certain portion needs to go back to the one who gave you the seed. That's what he's saying. That's really what he's saying. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So first he starts talking about doing good for the one who instructed you. That's in verse number six. Okay, let's go back to six. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. I'm reading it out the NIV. Okay, and then by verse 10, he said, not only that, but we should do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Why? Why are you saying that? Because you value. As we come to a close today, what do you value? Where's your evidence? If your life is being transformed by the miraculous power of God, if you're getting new courage in hard times, if you're being stabilized in storms, if, if you're being strengthened in crisis, if it helped your marriage, if it helped you with your kids, if, if it helped you to grow, if it helped you with your business, if it helped you with your life, if it helped you with your prayer life, if it helped you with your worship life, if it helped you to know Jesus, then sow unto it. Then sow unto it. I'm not saying if you if you harvest 12 bushels of corn to give away 12 bushels of corn, but to harvest 12 and not give one or two? How will, how will it sustain if it's all one-sided? It all comes back to what you value. Now, this is what I want you to get out of it. I want you to get out of it. Whoever God uses to instruct you in the word of God, be man enough, woman enough to sow into the instructor. Two, I want you to understand to him whom much is given, much is required. So we have an obligation to reach back and get other people and bring them up and teach them and train them and give them opportunities and hire them if you're in a position to do that, to give people. We have to help each other to get to where they're trying to go. Sometimes we even have to carry them for a while, but ultimately we want them to stand on their own uh, bottom, to be able to stand on their own two feet. Yeah. Number three, I want you to reevaluate yourself. Not too high, not too low. An honest evaluation. And the other thing I want you to get out of it, I want you to get out of that even if you didn't start out with the right appraisal and you never got the attention, the affirmation, the affection, or the financial support that you needed, let's wipe the slate clean. Let's wipe it clean. Come on. I'm wipe it clean. Right now, by faith in the spirit, you're being wiped clean. You're being wiped clean. You're being wiped clean. And let's start doing the affirmations that are necessary to build up that which the enemy tried to tear down. And the final thing I want you to get out of it is don't sweat the small stuff, Martha. Martha, you're worried about stuff you ought not to be worried about. One thing is needful. Get down to your one thing, Martha. Get down to your one thing. This girl is going to pay you back in spades. It's going to raise your brother from the dead. 
It's going to give you a place in the history of Jesus Christ. Thousands of years after you're gone, they're still going to be talking about you if you understand what Mary understands here. Mary has found her one thing. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalms 27. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. That's what I'm going to stare at that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, when trouble comes, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. Shall he hide me? He shall set me upon a rock. Why will he hide me? Because I found my one thing. One thing is needful, Martha. One thing is what matters, Martha. Getting this word in you and letting it do what it was designed to do. That is your one thing. Letting it transform and heal and correct and resurrect and restore and upgrade you. That is your one thing. That will increase your value. And if you've been passed around from dealerships to pawn ships and none of them really saw your value, find the collector who understands that car is a collective item, a designer's original, and so are you. This have I spoken to you, that your joy might be full and that it might remain in you and that you should bring forth much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bring forth much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Tonight we've been talking about values. Tonight, we've been talking about second chances. Tonight, we've been talking about self-worth. Tonight, we've been talking about God-worth and being poured out like water before him. Tonight, we've been talking about getting our values in the right place. Tonight, we've been talking about me. Tonight, we've been talking about you. Tonight, we've been talking about life. Life is all about values. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, rest, rule, and abide now, henceforth, and forevermore. And Mary was still in the house. Stay in the house. Stay staring at Jesus. Keep the main thing the main thing. Feed what's feeding you. If it's not feeding you, don't be a troll. Leave it alone. If I'm, if, if I'm teaching tonight and, and it's not feeding you, don't be a troll. Go. You don't have time to give attention to something that's not helping you to grow. Just go. Unfollow me. Life is too short to spend your life running behind people, throwing insults in the air. Find what's feeding you and reward what's feeding you and stare at it. Let somebody else do the dishes. Because there will never be another moment like the moment we're having right now, just me and you. This moment, 
God has given to you. Can I pray for you tonight? I don't know how this hit you. I don't know what it stirred up. I don't know what I stepped on, but I feel like I stepped on some stuff, stirred up some stuff, got into read your mail a little bit. And I want to pray with you that your values can be raised up to the level that they need to be. That you would value what is most important to you. That you would not allow people to undervalue you. That you would not inflate yourself because of your ego. But you'd be still and steady in the house. Staring at the teaching that's giving you life. Martha, Martha. I'm going to pray that you get rid of all of that worry you have about stuff that's really not that important. and find your need for one thing and stare at it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I crawl toward your throne in humility and yet with boldness. And I ask you, Lord, to touch your sons and daughters right where they are. There have been so many times in my life you had to correct my values, that they got pointed in the wrong direction, and I'm only here because you were merciful, and you've been so kind. Be merciful and be kind as we correct those things. There's somebody right now, Lord, that needs to correct their values, and I pray that they would do it in the name of Jesus and come to know you, even in this Bible class, in a fresh and a real and a meaningful way. I pray for the person who's always busy. They got so much to do, but one thing is needful for them. They're always doing this and doing that, but one thing is needful. They're always trying to fix this and straighten out that, and they're always talking to people. They're always doing One thing is needful. Shh, put them in a still place. Ah, ah. ah, put them in a still place and give them a calmness like Mary and not an anxiety like Martha. Set them down in you and let them rest in the fullness of what you have for them so that even when they face death and sickness and sorrow, that they are still in the house. I trust you to do it. I trust you that somebody's life has changed. I don't care if it's one person. I trust you tonight that somebody's life has changed. And I pray for everyone who has found this instruction valuable. And they've sowed it to it. And they always sow into it. And it's been so faithful. And they bless it. And they blessed it tonight. But I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, for an increase in their life. A harvest is coming. Don't let them be weary and well-doing. They're going to reap in due season if they faint not. I rebuke fatigue. This is no time to faint. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great night. I sure did enjoy hanging out with you tonight. I hope you enjoyed it too. Yes, you and me, spending Wednesday night, spending Wednesday night, wrapped and tied and tangled all up in the word of God. I love you. Thank God for you. Be blessed. And whatever you do, don't drop the mic.